Welcome to Conversations on Dance. Before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the podcast through your favorite app to be automatically notified of new episodes when they go live. While you are there, please take a moment to leave us a review. Leaving a review takes just a second and goes a long way in helping us grow the podcast and supports us in this endeavor. We appreciate you joining us today. Now, let's get to the episode. I'm Rebecca King Ferraro. And I'm Michael Sean Breeden, and you're listening to Conversations on Dance. On today's episode of Conversations on Dance, we are joined by Katie Hanlon Mayo, Associate Director of Charlotte Ballet Academy. We talked to Katie about how she reoriented her career goals as a teenager, working with Patricia McBride on Balancing Classics, her beginnings as a teacher while still having a demanding performing career, and how she sets short and long-term goals for her students as an individuals and entire classes. For more information about Charlotte Ballet Academy's summer intensive and year-round program, visit charlotteballet.org. Katie, thank you so much for joining us today. We're so excited to talk to you about your career and now the work you're doing as an educator. Um, But let's go back to the beginning and hear a little bit about how you first fell in love with dance. Well, um, I'll give you the condensed version of um, (laughs) my journey through dance. But um, I was just a very shy young girl. Um, I think the story goes that my mom took me to the pediatrician and I was hanging on her leg. I was so shy. And he said, Mm -hmm. you know, you should get her into dance or ballet because that might like bring her out of her shell and help her Mm -hmm. a little bit. And so she did. And the rest kind of took on a life of its own because um, as you both know, you know, ballet kind of chose me. (laughs) I I, I just, yeah. I just, it, it was something that like took me out of my shell and made me like feel just comfortable and seen. And so, um, yeah, from there, I just kept moving on. You know, I was fortunate mm-hmm. to have some wonderful teachers and, and live in an area that I had access to really great training. So. With those legs and feet, I can see how ballet chose you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're, not, you're too kind. <laughs> You know, I, I think that's something that's interesting that maybe we haven't talked too much about on the podcast, but like ballet as a way of, um, you know, allowing introverts to express themselves and be fully out there. Like I, uh, two people that come to mind as some of the most um, sort of extroverted, honest out there dancers, Allegra Kent and Janie Taylor, both have said that they were quite shy when they were younger or like you know, you see them dance and you think, oh, wow, they must be these like wild people in real life, but then they're soft spoken or, you know, um, so I think that's kind of a, a cool thing. The ballet allows us to to express ourselves without using our voices at that age where you're not necessarily comfortable to have that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. And I see it in students sometimes where they just seem more at home in the studio. It's like this place where they feel like, they can, um, their personality comes out stronger than if they're just speaking to people right? Uh, or interacting socially. So it's, it's interesting, I think. Yeah. Did it, right. did ballet make you kind of feel instantly comfortable in that way? Did you kind of like start to come out of your shell? Like they thought maybe you would. I did. And actually now I think of myself as a rather outgoing person. So um, it's kind of <laughs> ironic, but um, right. no, it, it really, it, it just made, I always felt a comfort in the studio um, as far as just my voice, you know, I, I, I more comfortable than I was speaking with people or interacting right. with people. Right. So. Um, so, so where did you grow up then that allowed you to have access to good training? So I grew up um, on the South shore of Boston. And so I was fortunate to have a neighbor who had a wonderful instructor, um, Maureen Ruff. And I started taking class at her school and she quickly, um, and this was a wonderful, like generous thing that she did for me that she quickly told my parents, you know, it's great that she's training here, but she needs to go into Boston ballet for more training. So, Mm -hmm. um, so I was able to to start training at Boston Ballet at a pretty young age because of her generosity and like her seeing that I want her to have more than just my studio. So it was really lovely right. because not always the case. Some teachers will be like, no, stay with me and don't go to a right. I 
<laughs> right. I, I love that you're on board with that because I, I, I still see that. And, but that's something that I always try to remember. You know, if your studio has a different kind of mission, you know, some of the places I teach at where it's the, the focus is primarily just sort of like a recreational thing or, you know, a, a dance is good for every child, but there is a very specific way that we need to train that is the pre-professional track and mm -hmm. if you're somewhere that you're not really going to get that that time is irreplaceable you can't you know you're that's just lost so mm -hmm. I, I love that your teacher did that for you yeah me too i was lucky very lucky yeah. so when did you start to realize that dance was the way you wanted to take your career and that you really wanted to pursue it well i think from a very young age i was I think Nutcracker really mm. like grabbed me, being able to perform in Nutcracker with Boston Ballet as a young child and watching the professionals from the wings. And I remember I had like, they had a souvenir book of all of the company dancers and I looked at it every night and memorized their information and I was obsessed mm -hmm. with them. So I think at that point I knew I want to be one of them. Like I, this is what I really it's all I want to do with my life. So mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. single minded, single laser focused. <laughs> right. Right. So as you're coming up then at Boston Ballet School, what was the sort of professional track you were looking at? Did you have your eyes on several different companies? Were you wanting to stay locally? Like how did that kind of um, bear out from there? I think um, this is a good lesson, actually, for younger students, because I think I grew up in this wonderful school with these amazing company dancers. So I was like, I want to be here. That's mm -hmm. all. I want to mm -hmm. be at Boston Ballet. And then throughout my time with the second company, I, I started dancing with the second company at a very young age. And um, then through dancing in the court of ballet roles in the, with the company, um, I my tune kind of changed a little bit. And mm -hmm. when I got older, I loved Boston Ballet. I loved the classics that we were doing, but I also was interested in doing more styles and different mm -hmm. um, choreography than we had been doing at the time, which is not the case now. Right. It was, it was very classical and, and some Balanchine, mm -hmm. and, and, but very classical. And, um, I think I, once I got into like high school age, I started to think, wow, there are so many other options out there that might be interesting as well. And so I brought in my, my scope for sure. But initially it was like, this is it, the here or nowhere. <laughs> right. Well, I think that's, I mean, that's really amazing. I think most people have that revelation like a little bit later. I mean, maybe one of the things is just like, it was lucky you were so gifted that the, the company was already using you at that young age. So you kind of got a preview before you had to like commit, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I think a lot of kids would just be like, I'm die hard for this place. And then it takes a few years to undo that. Like, even though your heart is telling you one thing, your mind is like, no, you've done this. Like, you, this is what you were doing. This is your track. Mm -hmm. Yes. Did, I also kind of reached a, a certain, I would say, burnout period where mm -hmm. I also was a little confused. What do I want to do? So in all fairness, I think because I had such like this crazy focus early on, at one point I had to kind of take a breath and be like, what is what do I really want to do, too? And I think that's right. valuable for for students, especially as they get into the their te older teens. You know, it can be very complicated. What do you now we were going to dig more into your work as an educator now, but I'm wondering how you kind of use that experience to help your students that can be on that one track mind. Because as we all know, even if you are planning on one company, it just doesn't always work out that way. And it sometimes it's really for the best, right? You end up at a company that's better for you. So how do you kind of help students maybe break out of that mindset and explore other things and think about being in a company from the perspective of what's their repertoire? Um, is that what you want to do instead of just like, I want to be in this named company because I'm familiar mm -hmm. with it or that kind of thing? I feel like I'm always guiding our students and our pre-professional trainees um, to keep in mind that the track, their journey or their track is, is it's not going to be linear, that it will have, you know, you may think, that you've reached your dream company and then a year into it feel like it's not, you're not flourishing in it and, and you should have the 
honesty and the bravery to try new things or maybe to not even um you know there may be a moment where you're just searching and there's nothing wrong with that i feel like a lot of dancers feel like that's failure but there's nothing right. wrong with taking time and um not feeling this crazy rush that if i don't make it into a company by 22 i'm a failure you know so right. i'm always counseling them and so is my my colleague laszlo berdo he's wonderful with this that um learn like the styles that you love and where you think that you would fit and mm -hmm. research and, and go to those companies. And if it doesn't work out, find something similar, like a, try to create your own path. And your first company doesn't have to be the company you're with for your entire career, but it could be a stepping stone um, right. to, to where you eventually will really find your place. Mm -hmm. you know? So when did you, realized that Charlotte was your place. You, you joined, um, it was then North Carolina Dance Theater. I'm wondering how that happened from Boston. Was Were you exploring a few different options and you landed there? What was the, the setup before you moved down to Charlotte? Yeah. Well, as I said, I had I was had moved on and was kind of a little bit burnt out, not certain even what I wanted to do. Um, and I was doing some guestings and I met the wonderful Jerry Cumry who's now, um, I think she is, at, she, well, I don't know her exact title. I know she's at Richmond Ballet, but she's also a repetitor for the Balanchine Trust. And she offered me a position at North Carolina Dance Theater. I had always known about the company. I knew they had this really eclectic repertoire and that they toured a lot. It was very different from what I came from. And so I thought, oh, maybe I'll try that for a year and kind of see what it's like i i, mm -hmm. I now as, as like looking back on it i think i think it's i don't know that i would do that now but as a young person i was like oh just try it for a year maybe mm -hmm. it'll work and i really connected with the then artistic director salvatore Aiello, mm -hmm. the choreography that he was um creating on me and the company i i was i just fell in love with mm -hmm. so um one year turned into 17 or 18 seasons. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> I get lose track. I just, I, every season when it came to rethinking, you know, where, if I would audition or if I, I you know, if I wanted to move to a, a different company, I always just felt so committed to him and then to Jean-Pierre and Patricia later when they became directors. So I just, I never looked back. It was kind of strange right. in a way. It's so funny that you say that about just like trying for one year, because I think Michael and I kind of, we talk about this a lot, right? That kids now can just research so much. There's so much out there about every company. There's YouTube, there's, you know, Instagram, there's all these things. But again, it's like the marketing department's putting that forward, you know? And mm -hmm. so it's, it's, you know, we would just hear by word of mouth, like I would hear like Miami City Ballet has all this Balanchine rep and people, you know, come from SAB and go down there. And I was like, oh, that's intriguing. Let me try for a year, you know, that kind of thing. And so I just wonder how it's different for kids now, you know, to like kind of you can do this research, but maybe that's almost a detriment, though, too, in a way, just kind of follow your gut and people that are interested in you, you know? Yeah, I mean, it, yes, because a lot of things are so curated now that mm -hmm. like, it looks amazing, of course, as it should. But, um, but yes, I think I had like I had heard from friends how amazing it was. Like word of mouth right. to me sometimes is uh, better than any Instagram search you could do. You know, having <laughs> friends in the company or or right. getting a sense of of the environment of the company from other mm -hmm. people, I think that's really valuable still. Mm -hmm. Right. You you said, you know, you you just you never really looked back. But did you have a moment where there was a like a definitive click where it's like, this is where I belong? You know, it's very easy once you spend 18 years somewhere to to look back and kind of rewrite the story. It's like and then it was happy ever after. And, and we stayed there forever. But did did you have a moment where it was like, OK, you know what? Now I'm secure here and I want to. I want to really develop my life in Charlotte. Yes, I think there was a moment where um, a guest uh, stager came and actually offered me a job in a much larger company. And mm -hmm. um, I had to 
think hard about that. You know, I, I mean, it, the options of, and, and of course it would have been going from doing like having a lot of work created on me and doing a lot of different works to possibly having to start from the beginning. And, right. um, which, um, I was torn. I was torn because mm -hmm. both are, are challenging in their own right. But I just felt like the rep that I was doing, I, I enjoyed it so much. And I enjoyed having so many opportunities and dancing so much that um, I just wanted to do that. I, I It just felt right to me to stay. Right. For sure. Right. I mean, the rep, I, I found a little interview with you on the website and it said oh. that your last show was you, you did Stravinsky violin concerto concerto. Yes. Yeah. I mean, who can argue with that? Like yes. if I, if I was doing one of those arias, I think I'd stay put too. <laughs> yes. And the other ballet I was doing was the river. So, I mean, that's like this juxtaposition of these two yeah. masters and um, yeah. And, and it did not hurt to have Patricia McBride as like my mentor and, and teacher mm -hmm. and coach as well as Jean-Pierre Bonfou. Once I, you know, it just, I was really lucky with the leadership that I was able to work with. For sure. Right. We're, we're obsessed with, this is a, a very, very pro Patty podcast. We've had <laughs> Patricia McBride on, on before. She just, obviously she was such an, an incredible dancer and a dance icon and, but just the loveliest, warmest, most generous, um, human being and coach. So maybe you could talk a little bit about your time working with Patty and what some of the roles you worked with her on were. Um, well, we could spend the whole podcast right. talking about how <laughs> yeah. amazing Patty is because she's really, not only is she one of the kindest, if not the kindest human being, um, but she's extremely generous, but um, also demanding in her like she's relentless she's not a coach that's right. just like oh it's fine no she mm -hmm. really um she's an amazing coach and i was able to work with her on uh rubies and mm -hmm. tchaikovsky potida and um well she would coach us in our versions of um nutcracker sugar plum mm -hmm. um allegro concerto i think concerto barocco serenade i mean I always looked forward to working with Patty and knowing right. that it, it was going to be challenging because she was not going to take, she has a standard. She doesn't lower right. the standard. She'll keep mm -hmm. on you. Like even it could be your last performance. She'll come back and give you notes. <laughs> right. <laughs> I love that. Well, you, you, know? you never know when it's coming back, you know? Right. So. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Or when you're going to be an educator and be passing that information on, which of course you went on to do. Um, tell us about, you started at the Academy right when um, it started. So tell us why um, you wanted to take on that role at while you were still dancing and then at night going and working with the students. Yes, I was really fortunate in Boston. I had another wonderful choreographer I worked with, Jose Mateo, and he encouraged me to teach. And I was really young. I almost felt like too young to head the class, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but um, uh, for lack of being cliche, I fell in love with it. I, I fell in love with teaching. And so then when Sal Aiello started the school and asked me to teach, I found that teaching always energized me. Like my my co colleagues would be leaving for the day and it would be six o'clock, 6.30 and, they, and I would have to stay to teach. And sure, I would be tired, but I the minute I started teaching, I found this energy. It, it just, it, mm -hmm. it, um, I think that certain people, they, things that like skills will align with with you. And although I'm not, I've tried choreography and I'm not, I know that's not, that never clicked as like, oh yeah, this is what mm -hmm. I need to do. But teaching just really clicked with me and, mm -hmm. and energized me and the possibilities um, excite me even mm -hmm. still. Right. Right. I, I, it's so, so fun to hear you say that. I, I think of it I I feel the same way. Like last night, I have, at the end of a rehearsal day, I had to go teach, and I left at like eight o'clock, feeling up. I was like buzzing, you know. I was like, "How am I gonna go to bed now?" I feel so, <laughs> you know, invig reinvigorated after this long day. Um, but 
I'm wondering if you always had the idea. I mean, obviously, you're teaching while you you are still performing. Was it then super clear to you that that was what you were going to do once you retired from the stage? It was. I mean, I did. I I wanted to continue teaching. I I felt like after I had my daughter, I had my daughter in 2004, and then returned to dance. Um, but I really could see my future as a teacher. I, I, it started to kind of shift. I still love mm-hmm. dancing, but I found that um, as I came to that like point where I knew I was going to stop dancing. I was enjoying teaching even more. So I knew that Mm -hmm. that's what I wanted to, that's where I wanted to focus for sure. Right. Right. Yeah. And I, I, I just wonder too, how you thought that teaching maybe enhanced your dancing career, because Michael and I have talked about this too, that like once we would teach sometimes in the summers while we were still dancing, we would start kind of thinking of things in a different way, because it's not like you just think, okay, I'm going to pull up here and lift my elbow. It's like, you're thinking about how to say that to another dancer, how to find corrections. Mm-hmm. And so you're thinking of things in a different way. So I wonder if that was something you experienced as well. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. Like mm-hmm. I'd say to students now who are interested in teaching, start, start teaching, start. Um, it will give you this new perspective and you have to basically get inside the body of someone who may not have the same physical traits that you do, but right. it can it can give you these aha moments of, oh, if I did that while I was training, like the, the corrections right. that I'm giving to them right now, I should I could apply to my, myself, mm-hmm. even though I may not have heard it or thought of it before. So yeah, it's really if it's something you look to do, I say start sooner and start being open to teaching all levels, like not just Mm -hmm. the professionals, which are wonderful to teach. But, you know, I taught a lot of adult classes. That was really Mm -hmm. fun. Um, And then Mm -hmm. learning to teach the preschool. I mean, just go for it. Figure out where your niche is, you know. That's the thing that always scared me. I was always like, I'm never going to teach the babies because I don't know what to do with them, you know. So how do you kind of figure that out because it's just so different. You can't just teach yourself what you would want for a warm-up class, right? You have to do like really <laughs> rewind. <laughs> yes, because it's it's about so much repetition. And when you're teaching the older students, you have that element of repetition, but you're also trying to develop their artistry and so forth. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. you have to be comfortable with repetition and being able to capture attention and being able to, I don't want to say babysit, but like know how to um, control <laughs> yeah. the room, <laughs> you know, know how to Absolutely. control. It's a totally different beast. And I currently don't do it anymore, but I have experience doing it. And um, I have so much appreciation for those who are really skilled at it. I, mm-hmm. I honestly do because it's so important and it's so difficult for sure. Mm -hmm. right i mean i think it's it's the hardest job of anyone i think (laughs) it's it's it's, when you watch someone that is really skilled at it it's just it blows my mind Mm -hmm. yeah um but i want to hear a little bit about your personal approach or philosophy to teaching and i guess how long it took you to sort of settle into that or find your way from the time that you were first teaching i feel like i was able to learn from a lot of amazing teachers. Um, and I, I'm very honest, even in my classes, sometimes I'll say I've stolen this combination from Violet Verdi or from Alonzo mm-hmm, King, or, right. you know, <laughs> like I've tried to like grab the information and, um, and pass it along, but also find my own voice. I think as a younger teacher, I had a fear of, um, the students getting bored. And then totally. as, yeah, you feel like you, you know, you're out there with the jazz hands trying to right. <laughs> trying to come up with these amazing combinations. And then right. as I've developed as a teacher, I've learned that there's there's really a benefit to repetition um, and mm-hmm. a benefit to building on, you know, not just repetition for repetition's sakes, but, but building right. on that repetition, making it more challenging as you see fit, um, but also giving kids the and dancers i should say the opportunity to 
feel safe in the studio and feel like they can make mistakes and they're always moving big and they're always like pushing their limits physically. Mm -hmm. Um, My students will, that's one thing that I hope they take away from me is that not only do I love a brilliant technician or someone who understands technique fully, but a dancer who's like just putting it out there and is not afraid to like reach beyond their limbs and, and take up space is something that I tr- I really try to instill even more so than just like one technique, you know, like Baganova, Balanchi, you know, like I try, I right. just want a, a whole dancer. Mm-hmm. Right. You know what you said about, that. yeah, I love it too. What you said about the I would always be self-conscious. I'm like, oh, everyone's bored because I'm making them do like really technical things right now. And oh, they're going to hate ballet forever. And then they're going to not want to do it, you know? So how do you kind of reconcile that when you're dealing with kind of like that mid middle age um, student who's, you know, not at the highest level in high school, like already dedicated, but kind of like mm-hmm. making that decision and like, yes, you do have to do eight tendus on qua and they have to be beautiful, but ballet is also fun. <laughs> hmm yeah, I think that that it, it's it's the challenge of keeping it um, keeping them engaged in that. And, and so, what I try to do is when I think that there's value in them seeing that they're getting better. So, mm-hmm. see, seeing that they, although I'm doing this um, for maybe the fourth class in a row, wow, I was just able to do it so much better than I did before. But also being open to reading the room. You have mm-hmm. to read the room and you, as a teacher, I'm sure you both know when you start to lose the room. So realizing, right. okay, I'm going to reset here. We're going to work through the repetition, but maybe I'll add a porter bra that will like challenge their artistry more or something that like we can, we can find a way to really be in it together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. I like that. How, how would you say that the school has changed since you first started teaching in that very first year? Well, it's certainly grown. The school has grown. We've gotten, um, you know, we didn't have a pre-professional division and now we have that that's, um, that, that really helps the kids to have a point um, that from the academy, there's a jump off point where they can be selected into our pre-professional division. So that gives them something to look up to, aspire to. Not every student makes it into that, to that um, program. However, I think just knowing that it's such a strong program and that it can catapult you into a company, I think that's valuable for the youngest, even the youngest of dancers to see right. how, how that is. And, and I think it's changed in that we have tried to listen to the echo of what companies are doing you know like Mm -hmm, we mm -hmm. we have tried to and we're still trying I feel like I'm learning every day like how do I create a dancer who is like uh I'm not just training the dancer I'm training the human being but I'm also making them marketable if they want to have dance as part of their future be it in a company or in a university setting and so I'm always trying to we are always trying to find ways to adapt and add different styles and now more than ever I'm trying to add more styles like so that they dabble in um, um, styles that they might be asked to be very good at once they join a company on day one you know yes right yeah I mean versatility is the name of the game these days for sure Mm -hmm. yeah I um, wonder since we're um, we've been talking a lot on the podcast about summer intensives and that it's audition season right now. Um, and I know that's kind of something that you guys are going through right now. So it would be great to hear from you as someone who would be in the front of the room deciding in an audition class, kind of um, what you're looking for, what um, qualities you look for in a dancer and how dancers can kind of stand out in an audition environment. Well, it's funny you ask that because I listened to your podcast. It was a wonderful oh. podcast about um, just a, about summer intensive auditioning yeah. and so I I was like yelling into my I was listening in the car and I was like yelling <laughs> yes yes exactly. <laughs> I think what you can do what you can do is um, the laser focus on the instructor and not comparing yourself to others is something that you hit on and that I believe is so valuable. It can be so daunting as a student to walk into a room of all of these dancers that you're not used to being around 
And you can stu- get stuck in your head as to like, oh, look at how high her leg is or look how high he's jumping. I always say to my children and my students, comparison is the thief of joy. Mm-hmm. You have to go into the studio. <laughs> <So> good. <laughs> I, I so feel like good. I should have it like yes. on a sign yes. in my office. Yeah. But, um, you have to go in as hard as it is to do. We all know how difficult it is to do, but be focused on yourself. Be focused on the teacher. Show them your energy. You know, I think that it's, I'm drawn to students who really seem eager to be there and have a positive energy. And even if they don't do every combination perfectly, just to see that energy of like wanting to learn and wanting to grow, um, I might overlook a lot more because of that, that kind of, um, attitude. Mm -hmm. Um, Right. But in small details, I thought it was really valuable to say, Try to um, come into the studio almost in a performance mode as far as how you present yourself. Put your shoes in your tights. Wear the leotard that you feel most confident in. Like present yourself the way that you would want to present yourself for the cover of Point Magazine. Yeah. <laughs> you know? right. yeah. Um, yeah. And then you, then the, hopefully in turn, you'll have that confidence that just exudes to the teacher and the job's already done, you know? Yeah. So I, I, I think that right. you all hit on so many valuable things that I just completely agreed with. So Yay. Um, yeah, <laughs> good job. <laughs> you know, this is, I, I, this is a question I have for you and I'm almost thinking like for myself, I have this question for you. Like I'm, mm-hmm. I'm genuinely asking for your advice. Um, because you know, for as a teacher, I think it's easy or easier to implement short-term goals, you know, like, okay, this week I oh I want we I haven't been giving enough ground allegro, I want to do this or whatever. But the problem for me is thinking about an individual student's journey from September to June, you know, like that calendar year. Like wh- how do you make those plans for each person. And then as a, as a class, as a whole classroom, you have to execute a long-term plan as well. Yes. I think that I, I try to, I have goals for the end of the year for the entire class, but then I'm really, I feel like we all are invested in each student. Like there's, there's some students that may feel like they are falling behind. And I, I, Mm. without, um, making the class like completely focused on them. There are times that Mm -hmm. I may think like this, I know the student is struggling with this and I know the work that she needs to, to focus on is work that will also be valuable to everyone in the room. Mm -hmm. So there may Mm -hmm. be, there may be times where I pull it back just to address that student, but in the end it it does help the entire group. And, um, and I try to really, read the room as far as where it, you know, if I have them on Monday, then again, on Wednesday, on Monday, I try to reevaluate, evaluate, like, where do they, what went wrong as far as like Mm -hmm. us getting to this goal? Like, what what do we need to focus on? And so, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of, I think it's important to uh, take each student And even the students who are doing well, like kind of find places that they can help the others in the class. I feel like the sense of community in a class is really important. And if this makes sense, like just, just even focusing on that one child will, will help the whole group in a sense. Right. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I wonder, um, for you, for students who either attend um, Charlotte Ballet Academy for the summer intensive or for the year round, what is one main takeaway that you want them to kind of go off into their career with other than comparison is a thief of joy? Because I'm going <laughs> to use that all the time. Maybe we're going to put on yeah, a t-shirt. Sure. I don't know. <laughs> um, I want them to feel good about themselves and feel confident about their voice as a dancer. I want them to um, be curious about styles and open to different styles. Uh, But I really want them to have the ability to, um, to be a, a better person because of ballet. Um, that's very important to me. I think just to because 
they've trained so hard, you know, this, it can be such a siloed thing that like all you're doing, but if I want them to take what they learn in the studio and be able to put it into other aspects of their life, um, Mm -hmm. and having a voice moving with intention, being, um, present, all of those things I want them to have as a dancer and as a person. Totally. Kind of long, long-winded. Sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, I think that's the essential part of your ballet training, right? Whether you be a professional, become a professional or not, there's so much um, enrichment it can bring to your life in so many ways. Yeah, and I have students who are have be- gone on to become principal dancers in major companies, or doctors, or lawyers, or parents. I, I have an equal amount of pride for each one of them. You know, um, and so I think it's very important just to build good people. Right. Or try. <laughs> oh, I think that's such a beautiful way to round it out here. But maybe we could finish by saying how one might apply for the summer intensive program, or if you're looking to um, attend a year round program, if you, you know, maybe someone that is like trainee ready, pre professional age, tell us all the things about how we can get involved at Charlotte Ballet Academy. So our summer intensive auditions are happening now. In fact, I was in Philly and Boston and New York in the past couple of weeks. And this weekend I'll be at Texas Ballet Theater in Dallas. And um, so that tour is going on right now. And you can find the sites on our website. You can register on our website for our intensive The dates are June 26th through July 29th. It's a five-week program. However, if you're in the first two levels, you have a four-week option as well. Mm -hmm. Um, So you can audition at one of the um, national tour sites, or you can send in a video, um, again, through our website. And we review the videos because we know it's difficult to get into every city and And then we also have a junior intensive that is ages nine through 12 that um, we have auditions here at Charlotte Ballet for, but those also, we accept audition videos as well. Um, And so we do consider our pre-professional trainees during the summer, we make decisions about um, dancers we'd love to have stay for our year round training program. Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes they're identified on the tour and we tell them right away. And other times we say, please come to the summer intensive. We'll let you know within the first week or so if we'd like you to stay. So you're not blindsided and you can make actual plans for your Mm -hmm. fall um, within a a good time period. So um, yeah, that's how we, we have our summer intensive auditions happening right now. And we actually, um, we're really excited about it this year. Yeah, trying to get great. trying to get Michael in there to maybe come I and teach so. for I had us a, again. <laughs> I had a blast last summer. It was so fun. It was like I said, like we're talking about like one of those classes where you just leave and you're like, I don't have two more hours of that. That was yeah. fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the students loved you. So it was really wonderful. Oh, so thank, thank you. So Awesome. Well, thanks well, again for, for coming on and chatting with us. Oh, I so enjoyed it. Thank you both. And thank you for what you're doing. I think it's so valuable for um, parents and students and dance lovers to be able to hear all these wonderful interviews. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really we appreciate, appreciate your that. time.